Hello everyone, uh, I'm back again, nice to be here talking about another subject that I hold very dear, but I think this is the last time I do such a broad topic, because this stuff is very hard to condense into a manageable portion, but I'm going to do my best so that we're not going to go too much over time, and I want to talk about light and color because it's something that is very fundamental to being alive and also really affects our work as designers and I think it's something that we all have a lot to learn from and kind of my goal for today is that you walk away from this understanding a bit more about what light and color is and how to use that to your aesthetic advantage. So a little bit about me, I'm working in Fraktio as a UI UX designer. Uh, before I came here I was an entrepreneur doing everything from event photography to telling stories um, or telling, helping brands tell stories with video and all kinds of other things that relate to color and light. And throughout my career of taking photos and whatnot I've been actually kind of surprised when I was putting this all together about how I didn't need to Google too much and so pretty much all the photos here will be mine unless otherwise specified. And basically how I was thinking that this is going to go is that I'll first talk a little, about, a little bit about me and my past and then talk about some fundamentals about light, sprinkle in a little bit of color and then really give the beef with some tips. So let's dive right in. Um, this is me, <laughs> 15 year old playing with a webcam and a desk lamp, just trying out some stuff. And uh, it's something that's fascinated me for a long time. Uh, I remember when I first got my Nokia N73, it was capable of taking decent photos for a mobile phone, and I've been kind of snapping away ever since. First dreaming of like a decent camera, and then figuring out how the hell to use one once I got it one. So, you know, ever since... I started shooting, I've always been kind of fascinated, like why do some shapes and colors and textures seem really fascinating and asking me to take their photo in a way and others don't. And throughout this journey, like when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time at my family's cottage and I've always liked the outdoors and I've always liked the star sky. So I kind of combined that with photography. I really liked going outdoors, photographing nature and myself. Uh, this is one photo from 2014, I think, yeah, 2013, 2014, uh, and I used like a um, cell phone flashlight to create an outline of myself. And um, so one thing that I've photographed a lot is my cottage, and it's kind of interesting because it's also a bit of a snapshot of how cameras on phones have developed because this is like from back in the day and this is a bit more now day. <laughs> Nowadays, so I mean, technology develops, my understanding of light and color has developed, and this has always kind of been a benchmark in a way, because this view doesn't really change physically, but its appearance is all the time in flux. By looking at it, I see it in different seasons, different colors. Uh, I see how, for example, when I go there early in the spring, how the ice creates this kind of different pattern of reflection on the on the lake. And with my more sturdy camera, I can get up close and sometimes you can't even see what's behind the island if it's really foggy. Other times it feels like you can't actually make out the island itself, only its outline because of the fog and the color conditions. And it always really fascinated me, like how, why is it sometimes, uh, how can one place look so different basically? And so as I've traveled, I've kind of taken a lot of photos and this question just kind of got more complex in a way of like, you know, I'd go around the world, some places it would actually look like, it, you know, straight out of the camera, like very different from what I was used to seeing in Northern Europe. Uh, and then again, some places in Northern Europe look like they're from a whole nother, you know, they look like computer render in a way. And I think I was always been fascinated by like what is it that causes all of this difference. But along the way, 
I got an answer to a really or like this eureka moment of sorts of like what is photography itself because as the more I took photos especially at night time the more I realized that photography ultimately it's painting with light it's using light as a brush in a way and using the cap camera to capture that light into a single frame and um, you know, like I would, for example, go out and take photos of the stars and then use like my phone light to illuminate some trees for a bit or something like that. And all of these things really fascinated me. And I realized that what I need to do is I need to start studying light in a more controlled environment. So I decided I'd start doing some studio portraiture. And it started really small and really humble. You know, this is uh, my brother's band. We're just at my home. We're using one of those IKEA sphere lamps uh, to illuminate all of this. And it was really interesting. Like, I realized how much you could do with the limitation of one light source and how much it affects how we perceive people and uh, their intents and, and, and their personalities. And, you know, I kept shooting, kept trying. I actually used like uh, steady lights, these CFLs, which are more used for uh, video work. And the more I shot, the more I kind of like got a grasp of things, started to get results that I liked, started to understand more about what works and what doesn't. And I, I, I started being really happy with the results I was getting. And, uh, you know, there was sharpness, there was crispness. I could do different types of like moods in a way. But there was a lot of challenges, especially like when there'd be more than one person and they'd be in bit different depths and my studio was small and it was really tricky. But, you know, I just keep trying and not just people, objects, trying them in different light, different combinations, just trying out stuff. If I had an idea, I'd just try it out. And instead of going like really wide and bright, maybe if I have a little slit of color, like uh, of light, then how would that affect how I see uh, through the camera? And, Throughout all of this, you have to remember, if you're taking portraitures, make sure that your subjects are awake and they're very best selves. Otherwise, <laughs> you're going to get technically great shots, but they're not going to tell much of a story, even though I love this photo. And I realized more and more, as I was taking photos, I was less and less concerned with, um, you know, what are the light values? I started asking bigger questions, deeper questions, like, you know, what is the mood I want to convey? What is the, the, the atmosphere that I want to create with my photos? And, you know, I'll be the first to say I'm still, I consider myself a beginner. I'm only at the beginning of my journey, but I've gotten to the point where I finally started to feel that I can imagine images and then make them a reality. And that's been a really nice thing to, to, to feel, to really see this like progress of understanding what light is in a very fundamental way. And it's really, the studio work has helped inform other work when I'm, for example, in a more natural environment, uh, to use that light to my best advantage or combining both. So I have ambient light and I use a fill light. So for example, here is director Mark Noonan in Musikitalo and I used a, a bright LED lamp so that I could drown out the, the background. If you've ever been to Musikitalo, you know that it's filled with a lot of ambient light. But if you bring in even brighter light, you can kind of make the background seem a bit ethereal and anywhere possibly and for example a dim gym can start looking a bit more fresh and balanced and i realized that this was really a big difference in what we consider kind of everyday photography and something that you would maybe see printed somewhere so you know what is this whole light and color thing that i'm talking about like if we're actually painting light and color into a camera, then how far does this thing go, this whole metaphor and idea of light and color and photography? How deep does it go? Well, if you guys have any questions while I'm going through all of this, you know, raise your hand, ask, or wait till the end. I'll try to answer your questions, but I can't guarantee I have an answer because, as I said, I'm more of a hobbyist slash beginner in all of this, but, you know, if we talk about the fundamental aspect of what is light, 
you know, this is an image by the Hubble telescope called the Ul Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And every little speck of light that you can see here is an entire galaxy. And it was taken from a very small portion of the visible night sky over a course of days with really advanced filters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it just shows that the universe is full of light. There's just an abundance of it, even though space itself is pretty damn dark. And so light consists of photons, which are basically small packets of energy. And everything in the electromagnetic spectrum can be considered light, but there's only a small portion of it that's actually visible that we see. And, you know, this is maybe a good thing, uh, because if we saw what's out there, so to say, we'd be pretty blinded. So this is what, like, Capitol Hill would look like if Wi-Fi signals were visible. Uh, so it's, it's maybe a good thing that um, we don't see everything. But it's important to note that light interacts with its environment. It's not a static thing that moves through space. But through space, it does move. You know, and maybe you guys know the saying, like, in space, no one can hear you scream. And that's true. Sound does not move through space. Space is a vacuum. And sound needs a medium through which to travel. And this was a big question for science, like how can light reach us through a vacuum if there's nothing in space? And this was actually a really big and interesting challenge for science. Uh, there's a lot of theories about the ether that we just can't measure, haven't learned to measure. But actually, through uh, realizing it's how light behaves in space, we realize that actually it's electromagnetic, it propels itself. But the reason why I mention this and why it's important is that it is something that does interact with the space it goes through. So here we have a straw in a glass filled with water, and it's distorted. Why is that? This is very fundamental to everything in, in terms of with light, because uh, water has a different density from air, and this causes uh, light to bend. And also, the concave shape of the glass makes it seem magnified. Uh, and this is called refraction. And it happens to everything to varying degrees around us. If we see reflections bouncing off of uh, screens or glasses or whatever, there's refraction involved. And it gets even crazier. Like, if you have something behind uh, glass, it's not only upside down, it's inverted. Like, what's up with that? That's crazy, yo. But there's a very good reason for it. And, you know, lenses, refraction, distortion, all of this sounds like a camera lens, right? But where is the difference between a human eye and a, a camera lens? Like, what, are we talking about the same thing? Are we talking about a different thing? Like, what is all of this? Well, there is surprisingly a lot in common. So if you have light, these beams of uh, photons, and they hit a oblong or oval shape, they will condense into a point. But of course, it doesn't end there. It continues flipped onto a surface or whatever until it goes no more. Uh, so. This is basically, it can be your cornea at the back of your eye, it can be a camera sensor, it can be a wall. And the interesting thing is that, um, that this is the reason why things look inverted in a glass, because it basically is. I mean, if you look at raindrops on a window or another surface, as you can see, there's like these three chimneys poking out. But if we zoom in, and these raindrops, it's reversed. And this is just like the basics of optics, in a way. And this was actually the first form of cameras, which were called camera obscura, uh, which is basically you take a room and you make it really, really dark, so no light gets in, and you make a small hole on one end, and then you will see the outside world projected upside down uh, onto the wall adjacent to that hole. So, you know, this is a very complicated topic, uh, and it's you know, something that we could lose hours into, but I'm just going to stick to the fundamentals here of what's important to understand. There is no such thing as objectivity 
when it comes to light and capturing visual stuff. You're always distorting. If you compare the top left with the bottom right, you see a huge difference in how this person appears. Um, also in my photography, I've noticed that like if I take a picture, let's say of a hotel room, it looks way bigger if I'm taking a panorama and stitching multiple shots and the same hotel's conference hall, you see it even more. Because for example, these two walls you see at both ends of the photograph, they're actually, I'm in a corner and I've taken photographs that make it appear as if they're two adjacent walls or um, sorry, like perpendicular walls, but actually they're in a 90 degree angle to each other. And you can really see it from the lines of how it all concaves together. But, you know, am I saying that there's no difference between a camera and a human eye? Of course there is. Just look at it. <laughs> this is the fundamental difference between cameras and the human eye. A camera's lens is what, cap uh, I'm sorry, a camera's sensor is what captures the raw data of the light hitting it. But our eyes aren't the ones that are seeing. It's our brains. And our eyes are a product of evolution and it comes with a lot of baggage. And that's why things like this happen where you don't see four Pac-Men condensing toward the center. Your eyes really want to see a black square in the middle. It's just what happens. We are meaning seeking machines. And so this kind of imperfect system was not built for our world where we can manipulate and create all kinds of shapes and colors and sounds to our heart's delight. But it does establish some really um, fundamental frameworks with which we should work with and what animators and illustrators uh, and people of the visual arts uh, really uh, know of, whether consciously or subconsciously. And the thing is, is that like our eyes and how we see, we actually see a very small bit that's in focus at any given time. Our brain, if we look at uh, human eyes uh, in slow motion and really up close, they're all the time darting, but we don't notice it. To us, we're just looking at one point. But our brain basically creates this sense that there's, uh, that we have perfect vision. And the interesting thing is, like many people probably know here, that the human eye has a blind spot. So if you close one eye and you're just looking through one eye, there's a bit in your field of view that is actually like just dark. But you won't notice it because your brain fills in that last part. And it's actually pretty crazy. I didn't put it here because it would require a lot of uh, tuning. But basically, if you create a grid and you put a dot on it and you look at one end of the grid and then you start putting it away, at some point that dot will disappear, but the grid will remain. And it's really flippy. But basically, your brain is what sees, not your eyes. Your eyes put in uh, or take in the data through cones and your brain parses it into a full image. And of course, there's different types of eyes. Evolution says, uh, or like from what we know of uh, evolutionarily, the eye has independently formed 50 to 100 times, you know, for different functions. We have predator eyes that look forward and can gauge um, uh, much more clearly uh, the distance to an object. Or then we have animals that have eyes that look to both sides that are, have a bigger field of view uh, and are better at spotting predators. But there are some things that are good to know about what we see, what's actually out there in terms of light. Because if I asked you, you know, is there a lot of white and a lot of black in this image, like absolute, very dark blacks and very bright whites, you'd probably say yes. But if we look at a histogram which shows all the uh, kind of color info, or in this case, grayscale that's here, it actually shows that most of the color information here is in the mid-range. And this is where sight happens. Pretty much all of what we see happens in the mids. Uh, and if we actually take it to the extreme, you know, bump the contrast, so to say, we get a much more extreme polarization between the whites and the blacks, but we, create, we destroy that dynamic range in the middle. And that's where our sight is. And the interesting thing is, is that now if I bring in the color, you'll see this uh, kind of diffraction of the values into these different um, 
areas. And that's because color has different wavelengths that have different intensities to our senses. And that brings me to color. So color is, of course, very fundamental. Uh, and what we use, used to call it, or what we uh, call it, is the color spectrum. And it starts from the large waves, which is red. And beyond it, we have infrared which we can't see, but we can sense, called heat. And we have thermal imaging that allows it to become visible. And then we go through the yellows, the greens, then we get the mids. And then we get, at the high end, the blues and the violets. And beyond that, we have ultraviolet. Um, so the thing that's important to kind of comprehend is that pure white light consists of all the colors balanced harmoniously. Uh, so, you know, when we see stuff like trees or plants, what makes them green? Why do we see them as green? And the reason for that is chlorophyll, the little energy machines inside of uh, plant cells that uh, help use solar energy to break the bond between carbon and oxygen, smashes it, keeps the carbon, throws the oxygen out. I mean, plants and trees are literally made out of thin air. But to keep it relevant, the reason why they look green is because they take the long waves and the short waves. So if you take out the reds and you take out the blues, you're left with green. So trees and plants look green because that's the color that they don't keep, that they reflect outward. Um, and same with the atmosphere. The, the sun actually pumps out bright white light. But because of the contents of our atmosphere, it breaks it down uh, and the sun appears yellow and the sky appears blue. Uh, and these are actually complementary colors, meaning that they're on opposite sides of the color wheel, which I'll get to in just a bit. But the interesting thing here is to note is how color interacts with materials. Different materials interact with uh, light in a different way. You know, you have something like the sky or water, which can appear very calm and reflective. Uh, then you have stuff that's more gritty, like coffee beans and steel. And this really affects how you uh, see and experience the thing that you're looking at. And also, you know, there's light can sometimes pick up some stuff on the way, like these rocks are or uh, kind of this beige brownish, but then they pick up the cyan from the water and there's this interplay. And I find texture to be infinitely fascinating because it's really something that, uh, I mean, makes things things. And sometimes when we're like designing we're in, inside of uh, programs in the computer screen, we just have this kind of like flatness. Um, and I think that kind of subtle subtlety uh, of texture is something that we crave. Like we often get texture because of all the smudges that we have on our screens and we don't really notice it. But I think that without texture, if you have just bright flatness, it's, uh, it, it always feels removed from the world. Like we, I feel like we always impart some sort of texture in the things that we see. So one really good thing to know about color is the, different, the two different models we have for understanding color. So these are the color wheels, which uh, is something that humanity has kind of done ever since the age of Aristotle and Socrates. And Isaac Newton did a lot about uh, kind of differentiating different frequencies for color and whatnot. And here we have uh, Bezold's color chart. Uh, there's the German name down there. I've tried practicing rehearsing it, and I have given up completely. But basically what we have on top is the additive model, which is kind of how our eyes work and how computer screens and digital color works, where the more color information you have, the brighter and whiter it becomes. And then we have the print world, where the more color you have, the darker the color comes. So what we have basically is the red, green, and blue, or the RGB model. And we have the SMUC, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. And what these are are primary colors. So as you can see, there's 
red at the top, blue, and green. And in the middle of these two, the overlap, you have the secondary colors. Uh, and you can break this down even more to get tertiary and colors and so forth. But the thing to really point out here is that when you combine uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow, you don't get deep blacks. And that's why we have the K for key, which is black, because you need it to kind of create that rich um, color saturation that you want in print. So there's a lot of color out there. There's a lot of option, options in terms of what uh, you can use to build uh, whatever it is that you're creating. Um, and technology is only getting more and more advanced in being able to show all of that color. Um, and I mean, you know, just thinking about it makes my mind race in different ways. So let's keep it, keep it more grounded. So one thing that is good to know is that we have these different color schemes that we can use to help build color palettes. So we have monochromatic, which is basically the shades of a single color. We have complementary, which I mentioned before, which is basically the opposite. So if you want to select a color uh, that will go well with the color you already have, just look at what's on the opposite side of the color wheel. We have analogous, which is kind of like a third of from, like you take your color and then you look on both directions like a fan, what colors you have and pretty much you're going to be pretty safe with those. And then you have the triadic or the triad color scheme where you kind of take um, the split from where your color is. And this kind of naturally segues into tips. So what can you do to harness all this information to make more kick-ass things? Well, in terms of photography and light, know where your light is. Experiment. Try out different things. Here we see how much of an effect the angle of light, whether it's from above, straight on, or from below, can really affect how this guy seems. Like, I would trust this guy, and especially this guy, but this guy seems a bit shady. No offense to the guy. And how this affects design and informs how we do our work here at Fraktio is interfaces. You know, we have these ways of seeing the world, and when we design interfaces, when we create systems to be used, we have to ask ourselves, like, are we working in tandem uh, to complement the human way of seeing things, or are we trying to kind of go against it? Um, so Google, for example, has what they call material design, and it's a framework or a design language that they've cultivated and uh, are building upon <coughs> to help kind of have this material basis for uh, their, their interfaces, and it kind of gives us a feeling, a sense of place and how things work. And I think it's really important because kind of there is no such thing as a blank slate. As we saw from the optical illusions and the discussion of how we perceive, like there's all this baggage that we come with, so why not work with them instead of trying to impose something very um, novel for the sake of novelty? So one thing that I did uh, was I took some photos of just a white box to kind of like illustrate how in design we can use these principles to our advantage. So here we have a white box. It's made out of wood, but it's painted white. It's pretty matte, so it's not super glossy. It doesn't reflect much. And this is, uh, it's slightly elevated. I put some batteries under it, and it's kind of close to a window that's there above. And so you see it's kind of like this flat, very soft lighting. But then, if I bring in a light, boom, it gets much more um, kind of sharp. It, the hard, light, it becomes very hard. And because it's elevated in the angle of the light, you get a really long drop shadow underneath. Uh, and now if I take the batteries out and kind of bring it closer to the, to the floor, you see that the shadow gets much smaller. Uh, and also, the light isn't completely... Align, so you see that it starts kind of bleeding into here and it's missing that same on the left. And one kind of trend that's very common nowadays is these infinite or long shadows. And yeah, you can get that. You just have to put the light level with the object and kind of further away and then suddenly you get this long, long shadow. And so here we've had this wood box. You see it's kind of got this greeny texture on it and whatnot. So something very different, a remote. 
made of plastic, but not just any kind of plastic, two types of plastic. You got the shiny kind of faux brushed metal type of look that they were going for, and then you got the rubber buttons that are much more tactile. And as you can see, like if, you, if we really zoom in here, the kind of differences we have from the texture of how we got these straight lines that are catching light because of the height differences and it kind of goes into the nooks and crannies. And then you have these kind of more softer, less glossy. You don't really get these accents here on the top. They're just kind of smooth. They look smooth because they feel smooth and are smooth. It's how they interact with the light. And one last example is this lipstick that I took from my girlfriend. And you can see here that it's made of two different materials. I mean, they're both plastic, but they have different coating. And I don't know the, the projector here if it's really showing it, but you can actually see some of the gold kind of color reflecting onto the surface it's on. So here we have the light from really far above. And you notice that there's, even on the black, this really kind of glossy, sharp highlight. And we see it less, but we still see it here in the bottom as well, not just darkness. And this is something that I noticed that a lot of designers fail to take into consideration when they're designing buttons and whatnot. If they want to make it shiny, you got to have some shine at the bottom too. Um, and so if we bring it more 45 degree, we start seeing that light catch on the top. When we blast it from the top, we notice that both of them just totally blow out. We got super light refraction. And then if we have it from below, it looks slightly different. And so I've mentioned buttons and it's something of a pet peeve. We're going much better. Like I remember still web 2.0 and especially before that, the crazy wild, wild west of buttons that we used to have online. But still, you know, especially nowadays, I see a lot of stuff like this and even crazier things. And it's really like out there sometimes. And I'm just like, whoa. But using the principles that I mentioned before, you know, we can kind of tame this beast. We can, you know, it's not perfect. It's not great. It was quick. Don't, don't shoot me. But no, the, the point is, is that, you know, we kind of respect the, the physical properties of the material. Like if we wanted a more gel, like kind of aqua button thing, we could have this and not so harsh shadows, you know, leave something for the imagination. Even if we can't consciously see it doesn't mean that we don't subconsciously register it. And if we'd want to make it kind of more metallic, maybe we tighten it in like this. Uh, but, you know, you can do with much less. You can be kind of more subtle and make it look nice. It doesn't have to be in your face, especially if it's, an, if it's an interface. And I mean, you know, with basic light, we can create some structure. Just by having some black bars, we get a wireframe of an article. And so kind of building upon this into color, um, you know, there's a lot of woo-ha that goes into the emotions and kind of implications of what color is. But there is a lot of truth to it, too. You know, why are banks, for example, so often this navy blue? Because it's a color that elicits trust. And this is something that I think that it's really good for people to, uh, you know, think about in a way when they are choosing color about what is it that they're trying to communicate. You know, I don't completely subscribe to everything that's on this, but uh, still, I think that it's got some of the general ideas correct that, you know, red is a very active and exciting color. Uh, you know, purple is kind of more this in individual empathic um, wise color. Uh, and it's also very royal. And a lot of these things have historical implications as well. For example, purple used to be one of the hardest colors to synthesize, to make a pigment of. And so it was, uh, associated with royalty because they were the people who could afford to have purple pigment. But that's a whole other topic. Moving right along. This is tips after all. We have some really awesome tools online. I mean, more than I can count of tools that will help you create color schemes. So for example, Adobe Color is a very mainstream example here. Um, and so, you know, let's say we find a color. Let's say we get this kind of very uh, pastel-like blue. What do we do? How do we get more shades out of it, you know? I mean, if we wanted to, we could just, you know, add 15% black and we kind of get something. But this isn't very enticing and this kind of goes against what our eyes feel should be. So how about if instead we get this rich uh, gradient of blues? Now, how did I get this? 
would you be surprised if I said I got it from a picture? You know, kind of, if you want a shortcut to get great color schemes, use the world. You know, you don't have to think about it in a, in a, in a silo. But the general gist of it is, is that the brighter the color, the less saturated it becomes. The darker it gets, the, the more saturation it has. So here's a kind of nice example from the Adobe uh, Swatch uh, app on my phone. And here's that color scheme put into that wireframe that I showed. Very basic, you know, it's one color, but I think it works. So if there's one takeaway that I leave with you, it's that explore the world. Look at it for inspiration, whether it be for color, for shapes. Look at how we see and how things are in the physical world. You know, it's a treasure trove of all kinds of inspiration of what you could do. You know, it doesn't even have to be natural light. It can be things that you pull out from concerts or whatever. And most importantly, never stop exploring. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. All right. Well, hey, thanks for everyone for coming. <laughs> I'll be around. <laughs>